All right, so my last video where I just rambled and drew diagrams did really well and got a lot of views. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing in this video. This video is kind of an extension on the last one. I kind of show the process that I do at work kind of using a Git flow approach to software development. But some people might see that and be like, oh, that's an old approach, that's a bad approach. The gold standard for making software, at least that's what some people say, is using something called trunk-based development. So I wanna kind of give you an overview of what trunk-based development is. And I wanna remind you, as an engineer, every approach has trade-offs, right? And it's your job to decide what trade-offs work best for your team and your project. That's why some teams decide to use Git Flow. It might give a little bit more stability in the long run. If your client is one of those people who like, the moment you ship a bug to production, they're calling you and asking you what's going on, then maybe one workflow might work better for your team. So trunk-based development, let's actually talk about it. When you're building software, you have multiple developers who are trying to create features and ship them somewhere, right? So you'll have a team, maybe that team has six people, maybe you're a solo dev, maybe you have multiple teams on your project, all trying to work together to build out a feature. Now to build out a feature, what you typically do is you need to grab the latest version of the code. Now one convention that a lot of people do is on GitHub, there is a main branch. So if I were to go ahead and just do like GitHub here and say main, whenever you wanna work on some code, you're gonna check off that main branch and you and your team of developers are gonna just start working on your feature. Now the main, now the most important thing about trunk-based development is that you don't have a bunch of other branches. You don't have like a dev branch, you don't have like a staging branch is what I showed in the last video. You really just work off of this main branch. And the idea is that every day you should be merging multiple PRs to main as often as possible, right? You're trying to improve the continuous integration so that every piece of work that's being worked on is continuously integrated multiple times a day. Now, the main benefits of doing this is that you get rapid feedback and you know that, hey, if dev over here is working on this feature, but dev over here is working on another feature and those features are actually having a ton of conflicts, you're gonna find out day one that, hey, maybe these two stories either need to be combined together or maybe one dev needs to wait, or maybe there's more coordination that needs to happen, right? So that's one of the main benefits of having trunk-based development is that you're continuously integrating. So your merge conflicts will happen much faster. And let me kind of talk about the, the other approach, right? If you have feature branches, someone may pull a story and work on that for three to four weeks. Someone else is gonna pull a story and work on it for three to four weeks. And then when they're like, oh, my story's ready, they're gonna go ahead and try to merge those changes together and you might get tons and tons of merge conflicts. That's not always the case, but sometimes if the story was kind of really overlapping with another story, it can cause a lot of issues. So I'll say check off, check out off main, and then I will just go ahead and say merge daily. So if we're merging daily, that means that every day there's pull requests being opened and the team has to allocate more time another day to make sure that, hey, those pull requests are getting reviewed. You kind of have to prioritize reviewing pull requests and merging them as often as possible. Otherwise, you know, you're losing that rapid feedback and continuous integration cycle. So another thing this really promotes is knowledge sharing. If all these developers are basically having to review code daily and understanding what all these different features are being changed on the daily basis, there's more knowledge sharing going on so that one developer kind of has a good picture of what's changing versus like a feature branch approach. You may not see what's being changed until three weeks to a month into the future. And then you'll have a pull request that's like 500 files long, has tons of changes. And let's be honest, when a pull request is that big, no one can actually thoroughly review it, right? It's just too hard. There's too much code. It's too exhausting, which is why another benefit of using trunk-based development is that your PRs are typically small. You might have a couple of file changes. You can review the PR in like five minutes, leave a comment, or just merge it if it seems good. But let's kind of talk more about the cons of this approach, right? If you're merging code daily into main, what could potentially happen is if you were to merge a bug, like let's say you just have some bad code and you merge that to main, and then all nine of your developers, let's say every morning they're supposed to pull main or multiple times a day they pull in main to their side branch, that bug is actually gonna get merged to all of these developers, right? So potentially, you might just break work for everybody on your team. And it's kind of like a red alert situation where like, okay, who broke this? We gotta go back and figure it out. Sometimes someone will have a fix and they'll talk about it. Other people might miss that message and they're just stuck there for hours trying to figure out why their stuff doesn't work. So. Doing all these pull requests daily 
increases your chance of breaking stuff. And that's potentially bad. Or what if someone breaks something and goes off to lunch or, you know, someone decides to push some code before they go on vacation and it breaks the entire project for everybody. These are real issues. And one circumvention of this is you have to write a lot of automated tests. Okay, so before you're even allowed to push code into main, you have tests that run. Just go ahead and put like a little icon here. So before you can actually merge the PR, you have a bunch of tests, right? Now the first line of defense is unit tests. And this is one way to make sure that the code you're writing is like proper. I personally think integration tests are a lot more useful. So you might also have a integration test. So I'll say integration test suite. And again, before this code can get into main, it has to pass unit tests, integration tests. You might have linters set up. You might have like a prettier formatter set up. You might have Cypress end to end tests. Some people use Playwright. There's a lot of things that you could do in the PR level to verify that everything is good so that when you merge that PR and all those checks are green, there's a lot lower chance that there's a breaking bug that makes it into all these developers. Now, overall, I say like for a smaller team or project, this works perfectly fine, right? This is actually like considered the gold standard by a lot of people because it just has a lot of benefits. And a lot of people in the industry have seen issues with just code that takes too long to get integrated with other code and it can cause a lot of bugs and overhead. Now, by the way, if there's anything I say wrong in these videos, feel free to leave a comment and call me out. I'm okay with that. Sometimes I say stuff that's incorrect and we're all here to kind of learn together. That's basically what trunk-based development um, encompasses. It doesn't really talk much about the deployments, although I am going to talk about that because it's kind of important because your deployment strategy kind of changes a little bit when you're doing this approach. So for anyone who's working on this community project I have, this code racer project, this is kind of the approach that we're taking, right? So people will make pull requests daily. Okay, here's a bunch of pull requests. People kind of put images of like what changed before and after. And then also we have a couple of checks that run. We don't have testing set up yet. We have like linters and we try to build a project to make sure TypeScript works fine. But we got three checks right now. And when those checks are done, we can basically just merge that into main and that gets deployed out to what we say production. So let's talk about the deployment side of things. So the moment you merge code into main, one approach that some teams and a lot of teams will do is that they will have a prod environment. Let's go ahead and say here, do prod. So what you should have is a bunch of like, let's say GitHub Actions. I'll go like this, you have a GitHub Action. Or some teams will use Jenkins or Circle CI, Travis CI, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, right? But basically, whenever you merge that PR into main, it's going to kick off a process that is going to get that code deployed somewhere, right? So typically you do a build and then you do a deploy. Sometimes you could do a test in here if you think that you need more testing. Um, so if you imagine this is the the work that's being worked on, every time someone merges a PR, this thing kicks off, it builds your, your package. If you're using like Docker, you could build a Docker image and get that deployed to a Kubernetes cluster or something like that. Or, you know, there's tons of ways that you can deploy your stuff. But the general sense is you have some type of like releasable thing, right? You have like a release, this is tagged with a number sometimes, or you can just do like a commit SHA, and that is going to be pushed to your production environment. Okay, so this could be like a website, whatever. This is like the most simplest approach that you can potentially do. And again, another huge win for trunk-based development is that the workflow is super simple. There's not a bunch of branches you have to do. There's not a bunch of back merging you have to do. There's not hot fixing that you have to do. If you encounter a bug in prod, you just do the same process. You make a PR to fix the bug, you get it deployed out, right? And the idea is that this time to deployment should be low, okay? This is key here. Because when you deploy your change, if there's a bug, you want to be able to fix that really, really fast, if possible. If there is a feedback on a feature, you want to be able to fix that uh, as fast as possible. One example I'd give is that I actually messaged a company and said, hey, it'd be really cool if your application had this feature. And within one hour, they emailed me back and they said, this is already deployed to prod. We just, we just implemented it for you and we deployed it. That is the kind of rapid feedback that you want to be able to achieve on your project. When a client or a customer asks for something, you should be able to get that deployed as fast as possible if needed, All right? And there's a bunch of more overhead with like the project management side of things that like that kind of impede progress due to like various processes and stuff. But that's like the gold standard, right? If someone asks for a change or you get a bug, like we should be able to get this over as fast as possible without breaking stuff. Now there's different approaches for deployment as well. Some people will actually like tag releases. So just merging stuff into main won't kick off a deployment. Sometimes they'll actually tag a release and that act of tagging a new release might kick off a deployment like that. So that line kind of goes away. And this is more of like a manual process. Sometimes you can automate it. 
But overall, the idea is the same, right? There's at some point you mark something as this needs to go to production and then you deploy it. So this potentially has a little bit of drawbacks, right? Let's talk about some of the drawbacks. If you're continuously pushing changes multiple times a day as often as possible, and those things are getting deployed to prod as fast and often as possible, that means that you're going to have unfinished features deploying to prod. Sometimes features are large. You can't finish them in a day. Sometimes it literally takes weeks to finish the feature just due to how complex it is. If one dev is over here working his eight hour day and he can only get so much done in the feature, the process is you got to get that stuff merged into main so that we can actually integrate together. But if you do that, that deploys the prod, which means that your users get unfinished features, which can be very off-putting and confusing. The one approach you can take that will kind of allow this process to work really well is doing something called feature flag. So if I were to go ahead and add like a database, what you can do is you can have a feature flag. I'll just say like feature flag database. Now this doesn't have to live in a database. This could live as environment variables on your deployed API. This could live, it, it's up to you, right? There's services out there that you can actually integrate with. I think like launch darkly is one. So like there could be a, you know, a feature flag SaaS product that you can use where your prod environment basically reads from the SaaS environment to figure out, okay, what needs to be turned on and off? Now, I do want to clarify there's two different types of flags. There's deployment flags and there's feature flags. I kind of just say feature flags for everything, but if you want to be like proper, what we're talking about here is a deployment flag. Um, a feature flag is more of like you need to actually just like test and experiment different features for users. You can do like A-B testing with feature flags. A deployment flag is basically you kick on a flag to true and then all your users are able to see that, uh, that new feature. I'll just go ahead and write both of them. Deployment flags, feature flags. It the, the point is, is that you have some type of Boolean that you can flick on and off so that when the product owner or your team decides that, hey, this feature seems ready, you can go ahead and turn it on and then all your users will start seeing that. I will say that deployment flags and feature flags are usually easier said than done because not every feature you add into your code base is just simple. I added like a new API or added a new page. Sometimes you're modifying a lot of existing functionality and you have to change a bunch of different places, which means you have feature flags and deployment flags sprinkled all throughout your code base, or you have a mechanism for like reading it from a centralized place in your code base. And it can get very complex very fast depending on what type of feature that you're adding, right? And if that is the case, sometimes I would refer to using like a feature branch if it's just too complicated and you're sprinkling flags everywhere. But I mean, your mileage may vary, right? Depending on the feature, it's just sometimes some stuff is more complex than others. So this works pretty good. Again, this is another approach that a lot of teams probably do, but some teams are more risk averse, right? If you're ever on a team or a project where you deploy a bug and your client starts calling you and threatening you like, hey, you should not be breaking production. Like you keep breaking production because of this process of you guys shipping stuff too often. Sometimes that's when more processes are added in. And this is kind of a symptom of like, maybe your test suite is not robust enough. Maybe you're just not, um, you don't have enough automated tests to really verify that the stuff that you're writing works, which I would probably go and spend more time writing more tests, integration tests, end-to-end -end tests like that. But if for whatever reason, you're just making your client very unhappy or your, your manager's unhappy that you just broke production for thousands of users and you've done it two days in a row, that's when you start having different environments kind of come into play. So going back to like the tags, the release tags. If you do your deployment through these release tags, so let's say you have a pipeline where you can just go ahead and type in, I want to deploy version 101, and that'll just go ahead and grab a tag and just deploy it to prod for you. Okay. The idea is that if your company or your team is a little bit more risk adverse, or you're working on software that like you can't have many production issues because you have like thousands of users using this or hundreds of thousands or whatever. And a single break in production means that you guys are going to be having like a team meeting and like a, a postmortem and all this other stuff and just more processes to figure out why a single bug was added to your system. I mean, bugs happen, right? I think that's also a training thing. You have to realize that bugs are going to get in production, but some teams are more risk adverse. So you might have like a pre prod environment or testing environment, staging environment. You can name this whatever you want. Every team calls this something different. But basically you could say, okay, I want to deploy a new version. I'll say like 1.0.2. I'm going to deploy this to pre-prod first so that I can have stakeholders. Let's just go ahead and do user here. I could say stakeholders. I could say a QA team. Um, I could say product owner. 
It's just basically people who want to check off things on a checkbox and verify that the work being done by the developers is actually good before someone goes and kicks off this process. Um, now, I will say that if you have like a, a designated QA team, some agile fundamentalist will say you shouldn't have a QA team. That just is a symptom of like you don't have proper testing. I still think that no matter what project you're on, it's good to have like someone who's able to really understand the feature being added and kind of click through because there's actually professional QA testers who are really good at finding bugs. Like that's their full-time job. I just find bugs and they're really good at getting your forms in a situation where bugs are going to happen. But as you can tell, this is like slowly adding more and more processes to what was working super well for your smaller scale project and team. But then, you know, you started breaking production on accident and now people are mad. So now they're like, you got to find ways to like not break production. And then you go and you add in this stuff and then hopefully it works. You run into more issues. You start changing your process more. That's kind of how software development evolves and how I've seen it um, over the years of me working. Uh, I will say again, I want to reiterate that your mileage will vary. Every team does stuff differently and that's fine. Do the thing that works for your team and project. Like if developers are not happy with how this whole process works, that's when your team has to realign and figure out how do we change the process and improve deployment speed, reduce bugs. Like these are the kind of the goals that you're looking for. Improve the developer happiness. And I also say this train people, right? Some people have this mindset that you can never get bugs into production. But some people have this man mentality that, hey, we have this pipeline that we can deploy a code fix in 10 minutes if we need to. And I'm sorry for just rambling. Like I just, just it just gets more and more complex, right? There's, there's something called like canary releases. So let's say you deploy your stuff to production, but you want to make sure that there are no issues, right? So what you do is you can do a canary release where you have a small subset of users, let's just say 5%, all use this new code that you guys just added. So that'll be like a deployment flag or feature flag where basically you turn on and say, I want new users or some subset of users, sorry, this might be a little small, to use this new feature, okay? So then you might have like logging set up. So I'll just go say logging, which is kind of monitoring prod and checking to see if, okay, are any of those 5% of users, are they getting bugs right now? Are we getting a ton of like 500 errors that, that stuff just keeps crashing for users? If so, then you can set up an automated process to just turn off the feature flag so that everyone goes back to 100% and these people are basically like this feature is no longer on. And then you can go back to the drawing board, try to fix the feature, get it deployed out, turn it on again, see if you get a bunch of errors. And if you don't, then you can slowly start trickling people in more and more until you got everyone over to this new feature. Okay. And again, drawing this stuff out on paper is always much easier than implementing it. The devil is in the details. Like this would seem pretty simple, but for someone who's never implemented it before, uh, maybe you're using like AWS and all this other stuff, like it can get pretty complex. Anyway, that's all I got for you for this video. Hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you guys learned at least one new thing from watching this. Um, if you guys have ideas of something you want to see me kind of talk about, I really like just diagramming stuff and talking about it. So leave a comment, let me know. Maybe I can plan another video. But uh, like always, I have a Discord channel. The link is in the description below. Be sure to join if you want to just find a place to hang out with other developers or just ask questions if you're stuck. I'm trying to build a nice, inclusive community just to help people out. Other than that, yeah, have a good day. Happy coding.